Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the virtual breakfast sessions. I'm Larry Sash, and your host. Uh, today, we're here to talk about hospitality in 2022. Um, now, whether you're a restaurateur, a hotel operator, uh, or you run a any storefront business, if you're meeting people face to face, you're in hospitality. And um, what you hear here, which is going to be hospitality in restaurants, in hospitality in hotels, um, easily converted to what you're doing. So without further ado, I'd like to go around the room and introduce the panel. Charles, why don't you start? Hey, I'm Charles Feldman. I'm a professor of food systems at Montclair State University in New Jersey. I've spent a number of years in the restaurant business. Um, Julie, thanks. Okay, thank you, Charles. Will? Um, Will Sears, I'm the vice president of the Lauren Hotel Group. Uh, I'm a co-founder and owner of Field Trip Restaurants in New York with three properties, and I'm former COO of Estiatorio Milos and uh, John Fraser Restaurants, so a number of years in hospitality and restaurants. Thank you, Will. Mike? I'm Mike Gansel. I'm a partner with Larry in our Strategic Advisory Board Initiative. I'm uh, acting as the co-host and the chat monitor, and uh, we'll uh, just be a silent uh, participant today. Okay, and, and people in the audience, remember, if you have a question or a point to make, chat with Mike, and Mike will make sure that your, your questions or comments get addressed. Fred. I'm Fred Clashman. I'm the editor and publisher of Total Food Service. Looking forward to a great session. Uh, thrilled that everybody could join us today. Thanks, Fred. Stratus, you're up. Uh, Stratus Morfogan, founder of Brooklyn Shop House, uh, Brooklyn Dumpling Shop, and current author of Be a Disruptor, um, which I released last week. Okay. Good luck on the book. Good luck on the book. Thank and you. Wes. Hello, guys. Wes Tyler. I am uh, the executive chef at the club at Carlton Woods here in the Woodlands, Texas. I've been doing this for a little over 15 years uh, in the industry. Looking forward to some great questions and discussion today. Okay. Well, you know, the, I, I, I looked this up before and it's an interesting comment. It is, what is the definition of hospitality? The friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. That's a nice blanket definition. But what is hospitality? Hospitality is different. It is, is as different to people as what is good music? Uh, you ask 15 different people and you'll get 15 different answers. So, you know, Charles, you were the person who brought this idea to me about what is hospitality. Uh, you are an academic. You are teaching hospitality and to, to students. Can you give me, you know, your idea of hospitality and why you think this is this conversation is important? Well, I, thanks, thanks, Larry. I, I do think this conversation is extremely important. Um, I'm going back to what is hospitality. I think it came from the word hospice, which is the Latin for giving care. Um, the hospitality, to me, uh, going back to Scoffier and shirt tail uh, with coattails and gowns and twelve course meals. It's changed tremendously over time. And as you mentioned, in the Bosch circuit, there's a certain hospitality there. What, what, what was a little bit frustrating to me in the last meetings, in all due respect to whoever attended, is that we talk about hospitality and taking care of customers, but we haven't discussed how it's changed. You know, I think it's more consumer driven now and we have to adjust. We can't just think the old way. We have to think the new way because it's as, as, as Larry mentioned, it's constantly evolving. So, so I'm hopeful that in this seminar today that we can figure out where, where we are as far as hospitality and may, maybe there are many different definitions of what hospitality is but where we are, where we were, where we are and where we're going, because I think it's critical for every business person who is in this industry to understand that. Okay. So, so hold up, Larry, one second. Go ahead. So let's sort of cut to the chase to, to some extent in that basically what we have now after two and a half years of takeout and delivery is we have 
businesses that have built tremendous takeout and delivery platforms. And now at the same time, they're welcoming back their previous guests who, who ate with them in their, uh, in their restaurants. Now the problem is they have more stress to have staff than they've ever had before. Right. Where do you start? How do you manage what is now two businesses with less staff than you had when you began with one business? That's what, I, that's what I'd like to know from the guys that are operating, Stratus, Will, guys like that. Where are we? Where do we go? How did we pivot? What, what's going on? I, but I, I'd like to add, add to that, though, uh, what, what consumer expectations are, too. Yes, yes. So, Stratus, you raised your hand first. Talk about disruptors. Here you are. Listen, um, unfortunately, hospitality historically has been late to embrace technology. Um, technology like we've done at Brooklyn Dumpling Shop with three employees, I can service a thousand people in a 12 hour period. The usual norm was eight to 10 employees. I can do it with three because I've re-engineered the automat and I've gave the consumer the control of the whole order process from the palm of their hand. I call a smartphone a cash register. I call a smartphone uh, a POS system. I call a smartphone um, uh, um, a self-ordering kiosk. When we start thinking like that, we are going to be able to make a more efficient business model because unfortunately, seven out of 10 restaurants fell within three years and they fell because of excessive payroll. Now, if you add the COVID issue of payroll, you can't even find good payroll. So like I said, embrace technology and a lot of these, a lot of these problems go by the wayside. And let me tell you, even with those three employees, you can still engage in hospitality, but it's completely at the consumer's discretion. It's not what we want. It's not us smothering them. It's not the us upselling them. It's giving the power back to the consumer. And that's what we did at Brooklyn Dumpling Shop. Yes, thank you. That is, and as I said, pe people's definition of hospitality is different. And it usually goes along age groups. Uh, Will, you had your hand raised before Charles. Well, I wanted to chime in what Charles was talking about and then take it a step further, right? So um, we talk about the term hospitality coming from hospice, right? The English language has only been around since like 550. I think Stratus can appreciate this next comment. There's a, there's a Greek word called philoxenia, which means welcoming somebody into your own home, right? That's 34 centuries old. Hospitality has been around a hell of a long time, Larry. Um, you know, I agree. I think that there are a lot of technological advancements that allow us to um, better economically run our business. I think that there will always be an argument to how that detracts and takes away from the hospitality that's offered. Like, look at, remember a year ago, everybody was up in arms because it was either Hilton or Marriott's. Somebody was getting rid of the, the restaurant and getting rid of breakfast and they were putting in an automated um, kind of like a, a modern luxurious electronic kiosk where people could come to it and press a button and they would get their, their, their egg sandwich or they'd get their you know, their, their yogurt parfaits or their fresh squeezed juices, no matter how you look at it, that takes away from, from what we in the industry and all my colleagues here uh, recognize as, as hospitality. Now, you know, I own three quick service restaurants, of course, like three line cooks doing 500 covers for a breakfast is a lot more economically efficient than seven. I think it's, I think it's about finding finding the ways to reduce that overall staff or reduce your needs as a business owner while not taking away too much of what makes a restaurant special or makes the invite to a guest to come in important. Okay, Charles, thank yeah, you. I, I just wanted to respectfully disagree a little bit with William. Um, I'm not sure that, that those technological innovations take away from hospitality, but I want to de deconstruct a little bit what Strat Stratus was saying. Um, I'm, 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 I'm confused whether the changes that you make in your, in your restaurants are ecology driven or driven by the need because you don't have enough employees or whether the consumers actually prefer that type of, uh, of, of mediation. Well, that's a great question. So at Brooklyn Dumpling Shop in Manhattan, where the crowd is mixed, uh, we see the 35 and over crowd walk in and see the automat. They say, whoa, I need an MIT degree to get a snack or get a meal. And they kind of get a little intimidated. But then when we open at UConn and Drexel and all the other university areas that were opening, 
they walk in and they just put their hand to the greeter and say, hey, I'm good. You know, when we turn on the uh, when we turn on our systems at 11:30 a.m., we have about 186 to 220 pre-existing orders that they've ordered on their phone. They've picked the time, and now they're receiving QR codes on their text message, and they're going to make they're making an appointment to walk into my shop, scan their phone, and be it in and out in 30 seconds. To me, that's where we've got to go with quick service and fast food. I'm not saying we should do this to this extent in fine dining, because I own Brooklyn Chop House. That's a fine dining establishment. I'm also implementing the automat there as well, but now it's gonna be flushed like an ATM machine on the curb uh, of the exterior of the building. This allows me now not to let uh, delivery drivers, which may not be dressed or hygienically uh, up to par walking into my fine dining restaurant. They wait outside, they get a QR code to their phone, they scan their phone like an ATM machine and pick up the hot food from a hot locker exterior. And people that don't want to walk into a restaurant with like their pajamas on because they think they got to get dressed up to pick up their to-go order, they can do that from the outside. So now we've got to rethink hospitality because I was born in hospitality, third generation, but we have to embrace technology. When I, re when I removed all the cashiers from Brooklyn Dumpling Shop and went with the automat, I got, I got cursed at in Vegas recently by someone saying, look at this yuppie a-hole who's stealing jobs. I said, well, you're the same guy that was probably protesting when the toll booths were removed from the LIE before we got to the Midtown Tunnel, where I had to wait 30 minutes, give $20 bill, take $10 back, and proceed through the Midtown Tunnel. Now, that same person, now that whizzes through at 30 miles an hour as their license plate gets scanned, <laughs> that same person is not protesting anymore because they got a taste of technology and they got a taste of doing it more effectively and efficiently. And now they're, they're like the way I've changed people's buying habits, we're changing people's routes. We're changing people's idea of going down the Midtown Tunnel now. They're not afraid of going through it because they know they don't have to wait 30 minutes to give $20 up. Technology is very important to hospitality. They go hand in hand. And, and let me tell you, we don't need cashiers at quick service restaurants. That makes me cringe when I walk into a restaurant and see five cashiers. We don't need toll booth clerks on the highway, and we don't need umpires behind home plate. Yes, I'm a baseball for that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Listen, we're going to change gears a little here. We're going to go to a different world. Wes. Yes. yes. Wes. So tell, what, tell everybody what you do and why your world is different. So I uh, work at a country club. We manage two properties. We've got uh, 36 holes and two different clubhouses, um, about 700 members. But, you know, it's, it's a little bit different than uh, uh, freestanding uh, restaurants because we've got the same 700 people that are coming in over and over and over again. So uh, whereas you might see, you know, new faces every day in a, in a, in a regular restaurant, um, we have to develop relationships, and uh, uh, our definition of hospitality, I think, is a little bit different. We, uh, I'll go back to the original uh, kind of statement. Um, we saw our goes during COVID increase 400%. Um, so that was really our way of, of uh, staying alive during COVID because we didn't have people in the clubhouse. Uh, we didn't have people coming through. They were just ordering to go and we, we offered a delivery program uh, where we were uh, taking it to their house. But um, once that went away, uh, it didn't create two businesses. You still did see a, a small uptick in the goes, but um, it kind of neutralized. And what we saw was people wanted to come back into the clubhouse, which I'm sure you see across the board, uh, but they wanted that hospitality. And I think what we're not discussing kind of early on here is, um, most people associate hospitality with a person being involved, uh, I think. So when they come into the club, they want to be taken care of. They want to be doted on. They want to be uh, uh, interactive with someone. And so that is our main goal. So the, the uh, digital platform doesn't really work in our world. Um, not that it doesn't in other aspects or, or areas of the industry. I think it does have its place. But um it doesn't have to take over and and again i think that if the association of the word hospitality with 
uh, being taken care of by a person is is the biggest aspect for us to, to really look at. Um, people here want that personal interaction, so we have to to uh, stand by the statement: we're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. I want to. Uh, can I uh, go ahead first? I'll, I'll chime in after you. Ahead, Charles. One question, Wes: What's the average age of your consumer? Uh, we are around fifty. So the older consumer. It is, it is. And then we're starting to see the younger consumer, but they still too want that, that personal interaction. They want to see uh, me out in the dining room and have those conversations and know who's cooking their food and, and again, develop those relationships. Um, because they're there day in, day out. They want to know uh, what's going on. So uh, that's an important part of my job is, is to get out there and, and formulate those and, and be involved with the membership so I can also see what they want. Um, and what their what their opinions and viewpoints are. Okay, Will, go ahead. You know, I I, I think that Stratus and Wes both bring up good points, and and I think Charles brings up a good point too. But there's I think there's a a very clearly defined difference between technology advancements in in increasing hospitality and economics in quick service or even casual service. And then those integrations within traditional sit down, more refined dining experiences, you know, and I think that there needs to be a, a clear difference between the two of those. I mean, you know, Larry, you know, I don't like to toot my own horn, but over my career, I've gotten four Michelin stars at, at various restaurants. I've gotten three sets of three stars from the New York Times. The most recent one was at 701 West at the edition in Times Square, where Pete Wells, a law, you know, uh, applauded the fact that all of the servers within the business were in quote unquote sommeliers and were able to talk to the table and understand guest preference and understand what kind of wine they wanted to drink. No matter how you look at it, no iPad that's got a wine list on it is able to create that relationship with the guest and anticipate their needs. All it can do is say, if you're having the fish, this is our recommendation. And I think that there's a profound difference with how we interact with people that that hospitality really is about forging that relationship with the guest. All right, go ahead, Strat Stratus. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt. So answering Wes, I 100% agree with you. There's, there's businesses like, you know, cruise ships and private country clubs. My, my brother's a chef at Pine Tree in, in Florida. He had restaurants from 50 years from Ajax Tavern to Trevinia, and now he's at Pine Tree. You know, he's basically retiring with Pine Tree. Uh, but there's inventory software and there's inventory technology that's incredible today. There is software right now that if you basically, if oregano goes up a quarter, it actually adjusts your food cost before the product is delivered. There's stuff like that that works for those types of businesses. And in regards to what Will said, I agree with you 100%. And I didn't know you're my neighbor with Times Square as we opened Chop House. So we got to break bread one night. But I will tell you with wine program, I'm opening Tapas Taverna next month with actually the former chef of Milos, uh, Peter Spiropoulos. And let me tell you, we're doing our wine program from $80 a bottle to $6,000 a bottle. And every one of those bottles are available by the glass because of the technology today. I'm gonna to be pouring out a $6,000 bottle by the glass. And with technology, I can preserve it for a year. So then we go straight to the blackboard and there I agree with you, Will, we got my sommelier on the floor and, and basically he is gonna be engaging with the guests. Technology can only assist and make your bottle more effective and more efficient by using the, the programs that you have to restore wine bottles that have been opened. You know, that's what I'm talking about. Technology works across the board. And with West, there's inventory software management where you can knock out a couple of jobs just on inventory and, and controlling your payroll and your food costs, just on backend software. So the software that I'm talking about, my crowd is 13 to 30. It's the TikTok generation. I got three daughters in that age group. They don't even want to talk to me. They live off their smartphone. They, they engage off their smartphone. They do everything off their smartphone. And I actually encourage it. I'm a parent that says, use your smartphone because that's their life. That, you know, they don't even use iPads anymore. And like I just said recently in, in an interview, the self-ordering kiosk that McDonald's is bragging about, that's going to go by the way of the fax machine any day now. Those self-ordering kiosks have a problem. The problem is their competition is 10 cents. $10,000 or 10 cents. 10 cents, what I mean is you can get a QR code and get a Xerox copy. And that QR code can do exactly what your self-ordering kiosk can do. That's a problem if I'm the ELOs of the world. 
That's a serious problem when my competition is 10 cents. Because now at Dumpling Shop, we're not doing four self-ordering kiosks. We're doing one for the 35 and over crowd. And the under 35 crowd, they don't even want to talk to us. They've already ordered off their phone. And they've already engaged with their phone because that's, they've already done the hard work for me. They bought their cash registers, which is AKA a smartphone. Thank you, Charles. Okay. Um, well, I agree there's separation between fine dining and, 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 and casual and fast. Um, but there is, has been changes historically in fine dining, um, dress code for one, uh, time spent eating for another, uh, smoking another one I could think of maybe a, a couple more. But my question is, uh, Stratus, your 30 year olds, do they eat at fine dining establishments? Uh, my fine dining, yeah, at Brooklyn Chop House, because we have a big like, you know, dim sum, you know, a lot of dumplings, you know, we do like 20 sandwich dumplings. So uh, yeah, we get a younger crowd as well, mixed in with the older crowd. I would say our crowd is 30 and over. Um, but because we're right next to Pace University, we do get a lot of families. Uh, but now with Times Square, it's, it's more like 30 and over in the theater crowd. Um, my, my point is that the under 30s are going to be 40 and 50 and 60 soon. And whether they're going to continue um, uh, um, trends that we've had in the past. Uh, Charles, that's the, that's the best point of this whole conversation. Absolutely. We believe what, the reason why eight out of 10 dumpling shops, we have over 100 contracts are opening in front of colleges or by next to universities. Because today they're at Drexel or UPenn or uh, SMU uh, or UConn. And tomorrow they're graduating, getting jobs and having their families wherever they're going to, whichever suburb or city. And we want to be there to meet them there as well. But it starts at universities. There's so many great QSR brands that started from university and started that relationship when they were 18 to 22. And it continued until they were grandparents. You know, let me break in here for a second. Like I said at the beginning, um, the uh, hospitality is different things to different people. You know, there was a movie uh, called Field of Dreams. And in the movie, the, the, the catch line is, if you build it, they will come. That ain't the case anymore with restaurants, yeah, gonna, what I, I'm I hearing. That, <laughs> I, that ain't the case anymore. I, I, no what way. I see is before you put You've got a concept in your head, but before you put the spade in the ground, there's got to be an awful lot of research that goes on. Um, uh, I, I just see it's, you know, yeah. it, you we could either open a restaurant and find out who your your crowd is and then have to change everything. Or Stratus, what did you do before you opened the dumpling shop? What at my career? Oh, I, I no, no, I'm talking right. about how did you decide? the dumpling shop from the chop house. Well, what happened was, is when we created chop house, I went to my 17 Chinese chefs because I own Chinese restaurants for 15 years prior to that. And I said, when you think of chop house, what do you think of chef Mai? And he was like, chop suey, chop sticks. Chopper is like a very respected position in the kitchen. It's <laughs> under the sous chef. I'm like, really? I think lamb chop, pork chop. So that was the creation of Brooklyn chop house was the fusion of mixing Beijing Chinese cooking, which I had been doing for 15 years, marrying it with an American steakhouse. Because every time I went to a great steakhouse, my wife who doesn't eat meat, she had a horrible time as I'm eating there like a pig with a three pound porterhouse by myself. She's having cream of spinach, baked potato and a shrimp cocktail. And I knew there was something wrong with it. And we came up with the concept of LSD, salt and pepper, ginger, garlic, lobster, married with three pound, 35 day dry aged beef, married with authentic Peking duck roasted, never fried. With that, we started going with the dumplings. And I said, I didn't want to do a cheeseburger at my chop house or French onion soup or lobster bisque at my chop house. We did French onion soup zao bang, which is French onion soup, but traditionally done in a soup dumpling. And then I did bacon cheeseburger shumai, pastrami, Reuben, Philly cheesesteak, lamb yudo, all in dumplings. The dumplings became such a big hit. Uh, that's where I said, I'm going to create the two ounce sandwich shop. And the two ounce sandwich shop to me is Brooklyn dumpling shop. Because a, a dumpling to me is a sandwich. When I grew up in my dad's Greek diner, I would stare down a pastrami sandwich bigger than my head as a 10-year-old busboy. And I'd be like, hell, hell no, do I want to bite that. But I would go for the cooked cheeseburger. But now with pastrami dumplings, I eat them like M&Ms. Dumplings are one of the greatest ways to introduce new foods to that age group. And Thank I've been you. doing that all my life with my kids. Thank you. Wes, yeah. in, in effect, you have 750 owners. Correct. 
Correct. 750 owners in your, so, your club. How do you come to the same ideas or the same finish that Stratus and Will do when everybody has a say in the way the place is run? So I try to take that out, right? So I try to dictate what they're going to eat uh, as much as I can. But I've been doing this a long time, so I know what they're looking for, right? They don't want to cook. They live on property. They've got their, uh, you know, nice houses and cars. And um, they want to come and uh, be dated on. They want to, this, this again, I think we're, we're talking about two different lanes here when we talk about hospitality. We're talking about uh, the fact that, yes, you can be taken care of. doesn't matter who does it. You've got a convenience food uh, market or something that's going to be quick. Or you've got the other lane where people want to come in and they want to have a true dining experience or an Epicurean experience. And that's, that's kind of the side that I'm on. Um, but, you know, even though we do have a set menus, uh, nothing set. When the, the members come in, they should look at my menu as an ingredient list, really, in, in, at the end of the day. Because if they want something and we're able to make it, then we're going to do it for them. Uh, we're there for them. And that's, that's what they pay for. That's what they, they pay to be uh, a member of the country club for. We are, we are an amenity, uh, so to speak. So um, it's a challenge, right? We, we have to be able to be accommodating, but it also gives us a lot of creativity and a lot of freedom uh, in the kitchen to be able to do things that we want to do. Uh, we get to try things out. And, and, and uh, we're not just locked into one set. Uh, or, or one type of cuisine. I've got to be able to know a little, you know, a little about a lot, uh, and try to know a lot about a lot. But um, I've got to be able to cook Chinese all the way down to uh, Latin American, uh, to uh, French, to you know, a little bit of everything because you never know who's going to walk in and, and want to have uh, a different type of experience too when they eat. So um, I think I think I'm kind of in a, a different world over here than than you guys are, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's a unique, a unique position. And, and, um, I find it, I find it interesting. It keeps me on my toes because I've got to know, uh, you know, quite a bit of, of, uh, information and be able to, to think fast on my feet. So. You just, you just, you just chimed in with the key. I need to know the right information. The right information. Will, you, you're opening up restaurants and hotels all over the country. Um, how do you find that information? What do you do to guide I mean, the opening? Yeah, I mean, I'm, op I'm opening up hotels over the world, not just restaurants, right, Larry? And, yes. and there's, there's one thing that, that's a hot topic. Can I bring that up real quick? Go ahead. I think that there is there's something that Stratus and Wes and Charles have all chimed in on that we haven't yet discussed, which is there is a a difference between the country club of our youth and the country club for the 13 to 30 year old TikTokers. And I think that we have to at least acknowledge that. I mean, I'm a member at Soho House, right? And if you go into Soho House, whether you're New York, LA, Austin, Texas, wherever, you can order your food from the QR code that's on your table. You can do that. That's a membership club. You pay a membership to join. You join because there's a pool and there's a hotel accommodations for all the same reasons that you would join a country club. You know, Wes already commented the average age of the club is 50 plus. If you read any of these articles out there right now, the biggest challenge with country clubs is new membership. And it's getting new members that are between 25 and 35 years old. And I think that there is an acknowledgement there that hits on everything that we're all talking about here, which is what do people want and what do people want at those age brackets? Why is the 28 to 35 year old not being the immense populace of joining a country club? Why do they opt to go to the intercity Soho house or Noy house or any of the 50 clubs that are in New York right now that you can just go at and chill and you can go out to Manhattan woods and go golfing on Saturday because there's a collaboration there, but instead you opt to pay arguably what 5,000, $6,000 more a year and, and, and opt for that inner city club that offers that. I think that there's something to acknowledge there, but how to answer your question super quick. Um, 
we, we do, uh, we look at comp set analysis. What are other hotels doing? What are people eating? We sit in the lobbies. We go out and dine in the restaurants. Where are their wins? Where are their misses? Um, and you have, you have to do that. You have to judge your experience based on what's in the market. Yes. Yes. I want to throw in one more thing too. So, you know, when, when we talk about experience, um, you know, it, it, from time to time, I'll go as far as handwriting menus. If I have a small dinner that's really intimate and personal for, you know, 10 or 12 uh, people, I will write that out and for each person and maybe sign the menu, but it, it gives a personal touch. Um, often I write uh, handwritten letters, thank you letters to people because it's more than just an email. It's more than just um, even a phone call. Uh, it, it's something that's tangible that they can grab onto that, that takes them back to that experience or enlightens them or uh, increases the, the, the experience as well. So anything on my side that I can do to make them have that experience, you were, you know, I keep saying experience, but make them have that experience um, and, and it be an enjoyable one is a win for me. That's my goal is to make them uh, want to come back to have a, a, a uh, a memory flashback whenever they bite into something, right? And and or I, I have a conversation with them, and they're able to, to reciprocate and, and and be involved. Uh, that's that's my goal. But again, I've got the same people there over and over and over again. So. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you 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 hit a point here. I want to go to Charles. I want to go to Stratus, and then I want to come back to me because I have something else, I, another little monkey wrench I want to throw in here. Uh, Charles, go ahead. What was your comment? So, uh, Wes, uh, I understand you do a lot of hands-on hospitality. You give a lot of care traditionally. Do you ever, you know, and I, I'm, and from my conversations I've had in other venues, that it's possible to do the same thing online um, with with customers or contact contact them online to give the same type of care. Do you, do you differentiate with, do you do that, number one? And number two, do you think it's as effective doing, more effective doing hands-on care in-house or can it be just as effective online? Yeah, well, I, I don't think it's the same thing if it's online versus hands-on and in-person. I think that's two different things. Um, we do do some online marketing. You have to be uh, up to date with technology and, and we have you know weekly emails that go out where we have uh, a higher level of access to people. Um, we want to keep them in the know, but uh, again, we don't want to put anything by the wayside. I want to be able to go out to a table and tell them about uh, the features that we're going to have this week or uh, the event that we're going to have for our members uh, you know in, in the coming days. So um, I think that they both have their place. Uh, we have, a, again, higher level of access through online uh, uh, technolo and technology standpoints, but um, I, I would never want to eliminate the, the hands-on because otherwise, what are we doing? You know, I, I don't need servers. I don't need uh, as many back-of-the-house people. I don't have to have a clubhouse anymore, right? It expands on beyond just uh you know the the, the technology aspect it, it starts to kind of negate everything else that we do we're we're our goal is to be a home away from home um and if you start to pull things away from that then it starts to become more convenient to stay at home and, and that's not necessarily what we want I, I just want to follow up with will because you have a much broader reach um it, it, can you substitute for, for hands-on hospitality online? To a point, to a point. I mean, when we open a new hotel, you know, there's 300 online invites that are sent out to an opening party. And then there's 150 invites that are handwritten by the CEO to a, a group of people sent with a bottle of champagne and a handwritten note that says, I'm so excited that you're joining. I can't wait to have you come in. And there's, there is an added difference behind that and you know while we are talking semantics now online versus handwritten you know stratus you're you're a business owner i'm sure that your reservations team has their list of invites to an opening friends and family and then you also have your vips those 25 those 30 people that you're shooting a text or giving a phone call to and saying and adding a, a personal touch to and so while yes i think there's a difference between 
handwritten an email, I do think there's also the argument that if it's personal, it can it can arguably be done electronically. Yeah, okay. so I, I agree with what both you, I, well, I agree with what you're saying because on my wall in my office, I've got a letter from Bloomberg and Clinton and what have you, and I cherish those letters and they're handwritten. But what we do, because we have to manage time. So what we do is my event planners, they have FaceTime with all, all, the, all the bosses of that event, there's FaceTimes. And then at the end, after the party's over, they'll FaceTime them the next day in the office. Say, hey, did you love the event? And we get a lot, a lot of good reaction to that. I, I wish we can write a letter to everybody, but that's just time management that we sometimes don't have. But a FaceTime could be five seconds. And boy, oh boy, are they surprised when they see the chef and they see the event planner and the head waiter and the head bartender all in one FaceTime saying, did you guys have a great time? Like I'm doing a party for Neo tonight, 700 people in Times Square. You know, he's going to get a, a FaceTime for me tomorrow. That's my new handwritten letter because I just don't have the time to write letters to everybody, but I wish I could. Because like I said, I agree with you, uh, Wes. I, um, I have them on my wall and I cherish them. But with time management, it's very difficult. And in regards to what Will um, said, uh, what, well, I'm sorry, what Will said before is, is the steakhouse audience is dying. When I spoke to the CEO of Del Frisco, he said to me, Stratus, this menu is not fair. And he said it in a loving way. And I said, what do you mean it's not fair, Norm? Why is it not fair? And he goes, because, you know, my great grandchildren of my original customers are not coming to Del Frisco. They're not spending $1,000 on a bottle of wine. They're not buying a $400 three hour meal. Their grandkids want nothing to do with us. And that's scaring the crap out of me. But if I knew I had pastrami dumplings and bacon cheeseburger dumplings and a lot of fun type of things, I knew I'm looking at your crowd now. Your crowd is around 30 to 50 year olds. My crowd is 55 to 90. And I'm getting concerned that how much longer do we have here as a traditional steakhouse? And, and there lies the problem and with country clubs as well. I don't know, but my brother's telling me on Pine Tree, you know, unless you're a golf enthusiast, you know, the TikTok generation of 30, 35 year old crowd have no interest in country clubs at those prices. Yeah. And they're looking alternatively to spend their money in, in hospitality and in entertaining. I'm and with you, Stratus. We, we have to adjust. I'm with Harry, you, Stratus. Listen, Harry, quick, before we do anything else, Dr. Eldon, you're unmuted. You had a question. Um, I, I just want to thank you so much for uh, basically inviting me to be part of this. I only got a couple of minutes. I was very intrigued with the, the group and uh, the discussion. I wanted just uh, to introduce myself. I'm a former New Yorker. I, I can relate to every each one of you, um, every corner of New York City. I've been here in Florida. I'm a heart doctor. I'm a board certified cardiologist. And now everybody knows the relationship between what we eat and the health status of that person. If you are what you eat and depends on that is the health outcome. Um, you know, health is the most important commodity as we know uh, after the pandemic, uh, it become real um, and uh, evident to everyone that this is the most important element. So for the last three years, I was uh, part of a keynote speaker in the Chire Conference, which is specifically for care, uh, healthcare. And, and uh, I developed this healthcare hospitality uh, along with, uh, with other folks in the uh, University of Arizona and so on. And uh, I don't know, maybe Larry stumbled I me mean, on LinkedIn, but I wanted to uh, uh, basically share the work uh, that, uh, that I developed. Um, also, really, hospitality is definitely a human interaction. There is no ifs and buts about it. You could have a little sprinkles of technology, but there is no replacement of the human factor. And really, it's all about taking care of people, just like healthcare. And I believe that um, uh, for, for that specific uh, uh, reason, I developed a model that's on-site pronto care hotels and clinics for Will, who's involved in hotels. I would very much love to have a conversation to see if we can spread this and make this a convenient um, um, uh, element for the comfort uh, of the everyone, especially those who are traveling, they're elderly, they have chronic disease, they have so many things. Uh, I believe also the wellness of the consumer is going to be a huge part of hospitality. I wanted to cure people. I want to be healthy. Don't eat the wrong stuff. Everybody knows now the Mediterranean diet is very hot. The, the olive oil is very hot. The data and research have, have already settled any discussion regarding that. 
So I, 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 Dr. I, Eldon? I squeezed a few minutes this morning just to be a part of this. Uh, but uh, I, I, I will be in know. contact with you on this, Dr. Eldon, and then and then we will talk about this. But I do want to take what Dr. Eldon just mentioned and carry it on to the group. And here's something here. Um, we, uh, Stratus, I'll, I'll be with you in a second. I, I know you're rich. Um, there is a, do we as restaurateurs, uh, as uh, hoteliers, do we have the responsibility to not only give people what they want, but sort of uh, introduce introduce new things to them that both taste good or economical and might be a healthy choice? I know in the younger people they're doing it, but people of my age group, um, not so much. How do we how do we do this? Um, you guys are creative. You guys uh, definitely uh, know how to do these things. Stratus, on, on, on an easy, on a, how do you introduce something, uh, a plant-based, a vegetable-based dumpling into a group that's been eating pork dumplings and all sorts of meat dumplings for their whole lives? Give it away. Samples. We do it all the time. Uh, I'll see a bunch of meat eaters and I just sent them a bacon cheeseburger, vegan bacon cheeseburger dumpling, and I sent it to the table and they thought they were eating bacon cheeseburger dumplings and I told them that it was vegan and gluten free. And because I know I'm a carnivore to the max and when I eat stuff like that, I'm really like, hey, I really don't want to touch it. And I'm, I'm just not, I'm not into the vegan gluten free movement, but now a new chef is showing me these items and I'm like, wait. This is delicious. And I'm actually fooled by jackfruit thinking it was chicken and blah, blah, blah. And I got to tell you, it's absolutely delicious. Uh, but I just want to speak one thing on what the doctor said. I disagree with him respectfully. When doctors first started, there were house calls. And then that time was, that was so consuming to travel to go visit a patient. And that didn't work. And then we had to go to their office. And again, that's not working anymore because you got I, 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 to see my doctor. I've got to wait three months now to get an appointment. Telemedicine is the biggest industry right now in medical field. And the reason why it's there, it's because of supply and demand. And it makes it more cost effective for the doctor to make more money. And it gives better service to the patient where the patient can actually see a doctor, especially with therapists and psychiatry. The doctor can see the patient quicker and both parties are happy about it. So I totally disagree with what you're saying that you know, hospitality and doctors have to be engaged. No, telemedicine is the number one industry in your field. And the reason why that's happening is because of these communist leaders that shut us down these last two and a half years, mental illness is a big deal. And you know what? Doctors can't keep up. So telemedicine is embraced by me and that's using technology to make your business as a doctor more efficient, more effective, and you manage your time a lot better. So I disagree that technology and medicine when it comes to hospitality, doesn't go. And it's absolutely, to me, untrue. You guys need telemedicine, and that is your biggest growth industry right now. Hey, Respect Charles. Me. Oh, thank you. First, to respectfully, I think talking about nutrition and food is another topic for another session. But, but exactly what Travis said, we, we need to look at other fields to see what we can learn from them um, and bring into the hospitality industry. Certainly telemedicine is a, a, a good marker for what could be done. Oh, so, Will, uh, expand on this in, in what you're doing. Uh, yes. Can I respond to something Stratus said super quick? Is that all right, Larry? He, Anything I, you say is okay. Okay. Well, he brought up one example, which is true. Not that he needs validation from me, but he brought up one example, which is true. And I think it's important to call out some comp sets. If you look at Smith and Walensky, the founder of Smith and Walensky, right? His son is the owner of um, a quality, quality, the quality eats group, right? That is a modern interpretation. They get the 13 to 30 bangers. Like that is the group. And, and he understood that he couldn't continue to do Smith and Walensky's like his dad. He needed the modern approach. If you look at Morton Steakhouse, Morton Steakhouse, son, David, he's got a number of restaurants that are super trendy and, and people go to, he just opened one with us at Pen4. I mean, it's, it's, it's enter, it's casual. They've got wine lists on an iPad. You can check in for your table via an app for the building that's upstairs. Um, if you look at uh, 
not Pagani, uh, Lasardis on the Upper West Side. His son Massimo bought the entire street and he's got Uva and Key and Heels and he's got all these fun restaurants that are doing thousands of covers a day, but they are addressed at the, maybe not 13 to 30, maybe the 18 to 40 year old clientele, but they are finding success in evaluating technology and looking at those integrations because they recognize the old steakhouse model, the old mom and pop, like there comes a time that the, the new clientele for those businesses does not sustain the business model, which was there before. So I have to agree with Stratus 100% on that. And then on your point, I mean, we, you know, you know, I worked for John Frazier for a number of years. John's a vegetarian. Nick's had a Michelin star. Dovetail had a Michelin star. Both of those were, um, were very vegetable focused. I think people are health conscious now. I think that they are aware of, of what's there. And I think that when you look at smaller populace like New York City and Philadelphia and Miami and Los Angeles, there is a prominence and a, or a respect to farmer's market or farmer's market driven, driven food. And I think that the majority of things that come from a farmer's market are vegetables. So if you look on the older populace scale, the Gramercy Taverns of the world that are still successful, that are very market driven, and you look at the newer restaurants like Nick's or Dovetail or even what John's opening down, downtown, the Mercery, I mean, they are vegetable driven and people have a, have a respect to that. And people dine there because they, there is a perception of freshness and, and more health consciousness with that food. Okay. And so we've gone from a world where we could help, uh, we can move to f f meet the people. Uh, captive, Wes, how do you introduce plant-based, vegetable, vegetarian foods to your 750 bosses? Uh, I don't. I haven't. Um, most of what I do, if they have uh, dietary restrictions or um, uh, want something special, is all on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, Gluten-free is the biggest uh, that we've that we've actually introduced. Um, but as far as vegan and, and plant-based, it's uh, not something that we necessarily promote. Uh, but we're happy to accommodate uh, any any dietary restrictions or needs that you may may have. So, uh, you know, it's 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 a little different, I guess, in my world. But and, and there certainly are clubs who do uh, move to uh, more health conscious areas, and and we do do that to some extent, but not necessarily um, to the extent of of plant based proteins just yet. All right, thank you, Fred. Nothing wrong with it either. I mean, I, I think it's a great movement. Let me get to Fred first before I yep. go to you. Thank you, Wes. Fred, you raised your hand or did oh, you? Oh, no, just, no, no. I'm just listening. You just twitched? Sorry. Oh, okay. Just, just listening. Thank okay. You. Don't twitch anymore. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Stratus. <laughs> yes. So what we've done is we've, we've swapped out uh, flour for cornstarch. And most of every entree in Brooklyn Chop House is gluten-free, uh, just based on that easy switch. And if you understand the history of Beijing cooking, it's food of the emperors. They use cornstarch anyway. Uh, and so it really played well with our recipes. In regards to the 13 to 30 that we have at Brooklyn Dumpling Shop, you know, these college kids are more vegan and gluten-free, especially vegan, than any other, any other demo. They're, 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 they're switching to vegan at, at enormous rates. Uh, they're switching like, you know, my daughters, they're, they're all, and I, and I have steakhouses, and two out of three are vegan. Um, so that high school, college group, are really making the vegan movement serious. And I see that a lot at Brooklyn Dumpling Shop where we have the impossible dumpling. We have uh, you know, chicken thai, which is, made with, uh, which is made with jackfruit. So we're seeing a big, big turn in veganism, plant-based, and we're taking it all the way through from quick service to fine dining. And we're seeing a lot of success with it. Let me have a fast question with that. Are you answering their call or are you letting them know this is now available? And how are you doing that? We always have to listen to our customers. You know, so I've been listening to my customers and I'm gonna be honest here where I was a little resistant. Like, you know, we're, we're not gonna be everything to everybody, but when somebody showed me what an impossible, you know, plant-based burger, plant-based pork, plant-based bacon, I would, if you had told me this, I'd say, hell no, I have no interest in it. But when, when I tasted it, I can't lie, it was absolutely delicious. And that's coming from a hardcore carnivore. And I will tell you 
that I've now, and I've personally, I've put it into my diet and I feel really good and I've lost a bunch of pounds on it. Uh, but putting that aside, my customers love getting like a sweet and sour eggplant made with cornstarch fried. You know, they love getting these kind of, you know, fun ideas that are gluten-free and or vegan. And, and, and you know, again, you got to listen to your customers. I've been hearing about it, hearing about it. I've been resisting. And finally, when I started trying it, because I didn't want to even try it, I was so stubborn. And I got to tell you, I love it. I love it. I think it's absolutely incredible. So how do we get the yous of this world, the yous, the me's, the Fred's, the Mike's of this world? How do you see anybody here? How do you see getting them to take the first step more than than giving them a little snip of something? We're in the hospitality business, Larry. We're yeah. going to be in the hospitality. Sorry, sorry, Charles. Two, two seconds. We're in the hospitality business. If we're going to true, be true to hospitality, then you know we have to listen to the customer and we have to cater to the customer and we have to listen to their needs. And then we have to also, stop, you know, like, my, like with me, drop your ego, drop your stubbornness and give the customers what they want. As long as it's within the model of your business, you shouldn't be everything to everybody. But a vegan bacon cheeseburger is really fun to make it into a dumpling or make it into like an entree, um, you know, at your chop house. Uh, so we're, we're not, we're, we're staying within that it's com compatible to our existing menu. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. Yes, Travis, I hear you saying two different things. Uh, on, one, one, on one hand, you're saying you're introducing stuff. The other hand, you're saying you're listening to the consumer. So I'm wondering how you listen to the consumer. Well, well listen to the consumer first. <laughs> so but how? I you but how? How? Oh, I, 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 you know, I stand, I stay up all night. I don't outsource my social media. I do it myself. You know, I'll, I'll be answering social media uh, customer interactions till three in the morning. Someone last night just said, I, I do it till I fall asleep. Someone said, wow, I just asked you what, you know, where your porterhouse is from. And it's three in the morning. I'm going to tell Stratus that the service here is great. I took her a picture of me in my pajamas. And I said, this is me because that's, that's what I do. That's hospitality, right? That's hospitality, exactly. It could also be I, scary, I, Stratus. No, well, listen, not, not, not really, because they, they, they're calling out my name and saying, hey, I got to give a compliment to your, whoever's doing the customer service on your social media is pretty impressive. At three in the morning, they're responding. And, I, and I'm like, you know, don't you have to tell Stratus, I'm right here. I'm okay. doing it. Okay, on that note, on that note, we have to start wrapping it up. Uh, this has been great. This has been great. And uh, what I'd like to do now in the last few minutes that we have is go around the room and each person, please give that one takeaway that you think that you've gotten from this session that you think would help the people in the audience. Charles, you started off. Yeah. I, first of all, it's been very enlightening. Um, I see there's a dichotomy between Will, Wes, and, and Stratus. Um, and, 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 and sign a kind of a tenuous balance of hands-on versus online. And I think we need to get a hold of that and figure out where it's going to go in the future. So that, that's uh, my perspective. Oh, well. I think that, you know, Stratus brings an awesome perspective and Wes brings an awesome perspective and Charles' feedback was great. I think that what we need to figure out is how to convert those 13 to 30s who are spending the, the money for the dumplings into the 95 to $125 check average guests, because those are the conversions that we're going to need or else we will lose that segment of the market. Okay, Mike, as, and I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to put you on the spot. As a baby boomer who used to control the world, we used to control the world. And lately, we've been sort of like pushed aside for the younger generation. You posed a question, how do you get 55 year old pluses to do uh, to try new things? Uh, how do you how do we well, get you to try something new? Mike? I don't think it's as difficult as as uh, you're saying. Uh, I, I, uh, I heard I listened very carefully to everyone was saying. The issue of technology and hospitality is no question. And it's not a clash. It's really an embrace, it's an embracement. But it's not just embracing technology for the 13 to the uh, 30. It's also embracing it for the 50 plus. And, and th this entire discussion, in my opinion, left out the 50 plus. 
and we have the money. We may be not uh, the, the, the demographic in terms of being the, uh, the majority anymore, but we have the money and we go to restaurants and we want to be taken care of, but we also want technology to drive us as well. So, so I would suggest we come back again, maybe take this topic and talk about what, what about the 50 plus? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm technology, I am technology, I am technology astute. I can use a smartphone pretty much just, just as much as anybody. I started in technology in 1980. I might be a dinosaur, but I have embraced it. And many of my cohorts, people my age in their 70s have embraced it as well. We want to be part of the restaurateurs. We do not want to be excluded. Uh, so that's my take. Here, here. Fred. I, I can't thank everybody en enough for taking the time. And I think the takeaway is the idea of going to your vendor, getting samples, and put bringing those samples into the dining room and having people respond to them. I think it's a, a great and a brilliant idea. Okay. Stratus. Uh, I just got to answer Michael because I'm itching for that one. Michael, I agree with you 100%. But I will tell you that when I open up a university town, I have 300 uh, pre-existing orders that are used by their smartphone. When I open a market that's 35 and over, we have to handhold them. So that's the reality. But the technology is there for you to use it. I love to hear that you're using it. In regards to this combo, thank you for everybody. I thought this was really great. Um, but, you know, hospitality and technology are important. And I said this in 96 when I started my FultonStreet.com internet, bringing the Fulton fish market onto the web. They all laughed at me and said it was ridiculous. I just want to end like this. NFT and the metaverse is the future. We're going to launch the first NFT private club in Times Square at Brooklyn Chop House. And if you want to talk about technology 3.0, well, there it is. And hospitality 3.0. We're adding hospitality to the NFTs. And that will be a future discussion, I think, because I think it's important. But technology has to be embraced by hospitality. And it cannot be resisted. And that's what it's historically done in, in our industry, unfortunately. Stratus, hold up the book if you have a copy there. Okay. It's, it's, where, hold on. Where'd he go? Where, it's, where, it's, quick, on, good. it's on every, again? every major bookstore. Uh, okay. Amazon is Amazon specifically because we have a, a partnership with them. Great. But uh, it's been doing great. And it's basically a journey of a New York City restaurant tour pre Giuliani and post Giuliani on how we dealt from everything from mandates to organized crime. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Wes. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank, uh, thank all of you guys for, for participating and, and pointing out. I think it's a, a great discussion. And, you know, I think what we've highlighted here is there's multiple lanes to what hospitality is, and it's all. Uh, really circumstantial and depends on the concept uh, and you know really what your consumers would like uh, or are demanding. So um, you know there there's a hopefully never ending conversation about this because if it does then that means that we are probably all going to be out of jobs. Uh, but we we uh, uh, want to continue to talk about this and, and identify what's going to be best and, and um, uh, you know touch base on, on what hospitality really is. So, so again, thank you guys. And um, I would look forward to, to continuing the conversation at another time too. I think there's lots of good viewpoint perspectives in here. Oh, thank you, Wes. You know, I'd like to thank everybody for taking time today and coming out and spending this virtual breakfast with us. Um, there's two points that I'd like to make. And two- we, we haven't heard from Charles. You did. Yes, okay. first. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yes. That's those baby booms. Got wrapped up. Mine, oh, right. mine, mine goes. Go mine following, goes. Following everybody here. Mine goes here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Back to what I was saying before this baby boomer forgets his, his trend of thought. Um, there are two takeaways that I picked up here. Number one, we've seen different audiences here. You got to know your audience. You have to know you, your audience. I mean, everybody here says, you can't be everything to everyone except for Wes, who has to be everything for everyone. Um, but in general, when you open a place, you have to understand that you can't be everything to everyone and you have to know 
your target and gear things towards your target. Now, we did bring in things at the end, you know, plant-based and uh, vegetarian and, and replacements. Why did Larry bring that in? Because two weeks from now on the next virtual breakfast session, we're going to be talking about what are they serving over there? How do we get um, the omnivore, the carnivore, uh, how do we get uh, Wes's people to start ordering healthy, ordering vegan, vegetarian, plant-based? How do we get them to do that? It's one thing that you market to the people, but to the fans. That's, you know, preaching to the choir. You'll have nice, slow growth. But until you get guys like Charles, me, Mike, and Fred to order something because it looks and smells so darn good at that next table, until you get us to start ordering, it's gonna be a nice, slow growth. So come back and see us in two weeks. Um, I will be speaking to everyone here in the panel. Thanks again. And, you know, I used to say this all the time and I will continue saying it because we are getting another wave. Stay positive. And please, test negative. See you in two weeks. Thank you, everybody. Bye Thank now, you. folks. Thank you. Larry, stay on. But just stop recording. Don't.